welcome everybody from everywhere, from all over the U.S. and overseas. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Brian, for uh, inviting me. Um, so yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, when the rubber meets the road kind of work uh, from my experience. And I've had the opportunity to work on a lot of different projects all over the country and overseas. And uh, thank you to Elaine, who is uh, my mentor here uh, with Soil Food Web. Uh, we met back in the late 90s. And uh, ever since then, you know, I've been a real advocate of, of her work and the courses and the classes. So if you want to go to the first uh, slide. Sammy, thank you. So, uh, you know, let's talk about soil biology in the context to that. So restoring soil biology is not one size fits all solution, unlike what most chemical companies promote. So one of the things that has been a real uh, benefit for what we do is that, you know, no matter what kind of crop system we're working with, the, the, the foundation of what we're learning with the soil food web works on everything that's out there on this planet, in the soil. Um, you know, from, you know, we do a lot of work with ornamentals, trees and shrubs and landscapes to working out in large pastures uh, and uh, corn and soy. Um, you know, we've been very successful with the core uh, foundation of what the course teaches us. Um, so uh, if you want to go to the next one. So, you know, one of the foundations of what we do is actually making uh, the biocomplete compost and biocomplete extracts and biocomplete activated compost teased liquids. And there's many different methods to make that material um, from the thermophilic compost to vermicompost using a mesophilic process to static compost. Uh, so there's many different methods that we use uh, to make these materials uh, and we apply them both in a solid or a granular or a liquid. And um, you know, one of the things that uh, is important in making this high quality biocomplete material is doing the forensics, looking at this material and making sure it is of high quality, biologically speaking. Next. So I'm just gonna go over one of many of the uh, uh, projects that I had the opportunity to work on. And this is one of my larger projects out in the Midwest in uh, Jacksonville, Illinois, I met a group of uh, farmers. Uh, basically, these two gentlemen that I met, uh, Adam York and Brad Holbrook, are the fifth generation farmers from this operation. And so their, their, their families have been in the business of growing corn and soy for generations. And they were at the point where they could not produce any more yields with the conventional system or using the conventional wisdom. So they contacted me about five years ago and they were just starting to dabble with uh, soil biology. And so I came to them as a consultant and we started uh, this path of doing regenerative organic and biological farming and they've been extremely successful. And it's also been a, a, a real uh, learning process for me to have or see how we can take uh, working with small farms and take it to the next level with big ag. Um, next. So York Farm, uh, so York Farm in particular is one of probably, up, well, we're up to about 150,000 acres now with our process and our program with uh, AgroBio and uh, one of the owners of AgroBio has his own farm. So these two gentlemen, not only do they own and operate a facility or, or a company that manufactures product and biologicals, including the compost or the biocomplete compost, and biocomplete compost teas is they actually are doing the work. They actually have their own fields and their own farms. Uh, so it's actually products that are made by and used for farmers. Um, so they personally, each one of them has over 10,000 acres of soy and corn. And uh, they've been you know, in the business for, for decades, but in just the last five years, uh, they've been really uh, motivated and moving forward with regenerative farming and basically what we call transitioning from the conventional system to the regenerative process. And I, again, you know, this is a, a great opportunity for me to take what I've learned in the last two decades and really scale it up. You know, we're, like I said, we're, we're over a hundred thousand acres with our program and our process of making biocomplete compost 
in bio-complete uh, uh, compost extracts and, and active teas. Um, so it's been a really exciting project for me and also for them because they've been very successful. And one of the things that uh, I, I, you know, the take home message here is that, you know, we put together a plan early on when I first met these folks and we put together a three and a five year program and they stuck to it and they didn't deviate from the program. And that's one of the challenges with a lot of folks is they tend to deviate and do a little this and do a little that. And, you know, they, they feel that, you know, this combination of working with conventional uh, processes is, and working with biology will work together. Not, it doesn't always work together, but there is a process to transition uh, when we're going from conventional to the biological regenerative process. But just within the first three years of working with these folks, they saved over a million dollars just by cutting back on synthetic fertilizers, going from 200 units of nitrogen per acre down to 150 to even 50 units of nitrogen with the same, if not a better yield, which is really exciting to see them do that using the biological process. Um, and so, you know, some of the other things is uh, Roundup. They were 100% uh, using GMO uh, corn and soy and 100% Roundup to we're on year five now and they've eliminated Roundup 100% now. And they went from 100% GMO crops to they're about 80% non-GMO now. So really the next step is most of the, even the non-GMO seed is still coated Believe it or not, the seed is still coated with insecticides and fungicides, even though it's not GMO. So it's very difficult for them to even, you know, find these non-GMO, non-pesticide coated uh, seeds. But, you know, now we're starting to do that. We're in our fifth year and they're actually going with what's called naked seed, non-GMO with our regenerative program. And so I'm really excited to get to that next step with them. Uh, next. So. You know, one of the things that uh, as practitioners, you know, a lot of us work out in the field. I, I personally need to be outside. I have a hard time being in the office for more than an hour or two and I get all giddy and I got to get outside. So, uh, again, I, I had not only the opportunity, but the, 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 uh, the advantage of being out in the field a lot. And, and that's one thing I really enjoy. But as practitioners and I have been in, in the industry for so many years is well, I, I notice a lot of the little things that most people don't even notice that are underneath your feet. And in this particular picture on the left hand side, this was just this past summer. Um, on the left hand side is a conventional um, neighbor who's growing conventional corn. And on the right side is the, uh, at, uh, that's actually York Farms Field. And they're actually, uh, you know, that's 100% non GMO, no Roundup at all. And even the weeds, uh, one of the things that they have noticed quite a bit, especially within the last two years, is the weed species are changing dramatically from very invasive, uh, broadleaf type weeds to much less invasive uh, grass species. And that's one of the things I noticed here is that you'll see a lot of the grasses along the edges of their fields that have been, you know, that are now being managed regeneratively. And all the conventional fields, they're very clean, but you know, there's still sporadic weeds throughout a lot of the conventional fields because they just can't kill every single thing. And all the conventional fields, you know, we had a penetrometer, they were obviously not very, only very compacted, but I noticed a lot of broadleaf weeds in their fields, uh, many different varieties, where their fields, which they weren't using any herbicide, had very few, if any, broadleaf weeds and a lot of these uh, less invasive grass species, when you look at their biological relationship, their fungal to bacterial ratio of grasses are much like corn versus the broadleaves are much different. And the field on the right is actually us spraying. This is, uh, they actually invested in a sprayer just for applying biologicals, the liquid biocomplete compost, the extracts and the actives. So. I was really excited to find out they actually made that move financially, which was a big one, because these, these rigs are what, a quarter million dollars, um, specifically just to apply the liquids this past season. Present years, they were actually, we were trying to uh, use their conventional sprayers that had all kinds of herbicides in them. It is very difficult to, to uh, you know, clean them out and try to use biologicals. There's just too much contamination. 
So that's actually us spraying that exact same field that you see on the left. So you wanna to go to the next slide, please? So this is in June. This was my June visit. I usually visit these folks two or three times a year. And I started back in 2016 or 17. So this is uh, our June visit. So just in one year from 17 to 18, we went from producing 3,500 gallons of activated aerated compost tea. And, and I have to say it wasn't a very good quality. Um, it was basically, they were making excellent brown water. Um, but they were getting results from it. And so after getting all the data, we, what we realized is that the reason for the results that, you know, they were getting some improvements was mostly because of the foods and the amendments they were applying. It wasn't the biology. How did we know? We were testing. We did, we, you know, every single project I go on, we bring our microscopes, we bring our pipettes, we bring our slides. And so we are able to test on site which is you know, a real benefit and advantage for a lot of us because when you send samples, there are some challenges uh, you know, with sending live samples. So um, in general though, um, you know, they, uh, they, were, they had seven 500 gallon brewers that they were basically making active compost teas, which you know, in our world, I think Elaine coined this quite well, is it was really putrefied liquid. Uh, <laughs> compost teas. It wasn't really, you know, what we call biocomplete activated compost teas by any means. So in a 24-hour period, they were making on a scale of one to ten, probably about four when it comes to biocomplete active compost teas. Uh, and so in 2018, we went from making compost teas to compost extracts. Because one of the challenges when you start to scale this up you run into a lot of uh, challenges when it comes to time and volume. And so we had to produce up to 100,000 gallons per application. Now that becomes really challenging when you start trying to make that kind of active material. So to simplify things, which you know maybe at another time we can talk about the difference between active tea or active compost tea versus just compost extract. But anyhow, going forward, we went and set them up with a compost extractor. And so the compost extractor is not limited by time and volume, not nearly as much as activating the biology. So we were able to produce between 20 and 1,000 gallons of liquid compost extract, that's what the LCE is, in eight to 15 hours of much higher quality. We were really excited about the numbers we were seeing under the microscope, just with an extract. Uh, so there was a big difference so the spring application with the compost extractor, we were producing 10,000 plus gallons a day. We were applying it only at three to five gallons an acre, which I know is really a low rate, but we were doing it in furrow. So that real good quality compost extract is being applied directly to the seed in furrow in the springtime. And that, was, uh, that first application was 121,000 gallons. And that was just for the 10,000 gallon uh, operation. It doesn't include all the other acres that we did. Uh, you wanna move to the next one, please? So anyways, this is just some numbers you know, to uh, show you what we did in 2018. But again, this was a 10,000 acres of corn and soy. Um, and so 80% was non-GMO. Uh, they also, out of the 10,000 acres, they have about 3,500 acres, uh, about an hour south from their, their main farms. And uh, it's a very sand, they call it sugar sand, but 100% uh, dependent on irrigation, unfortunately. So they had about 28 pivots, uh, there it is, sorry, 26 pivots that managed the uh, 3,500 acres down south. And so I had the opportunity to go down there and uh, we were actually, uh, I was actually there uh, when we were doing the injection. And so one of the methods that we were using to apply the compost extract was through pivots. So uh, down south, the 26 pivots each got this uh, compost extract. But what we did is we took the compost extract uh, and we put it into these uh, brewers that they had. So we were no longer using these 500 gallon brewers uh, on site to make the extract. And so what we did is we converted them and we put them on trailers and then we would basically download our compost extract into the pivots 
and then and then apply the foods and aerate and then inject it into the pivots. So, you know, it's not a lot of product, but we were still really effective at getting the biology out. So in a 52 hour full circle, uh, we covered 300 acres and we applied about a thousand gallons of extract with foods, which came out to about three gallons per acre. So again, it's not a lot, but it is of high quality and we did see really good results with it. Um, so moving forward, uh, we started experimenting with the three gallon, five gallon and 11 gallons. And what was interesting is that the sweet spot was around five gallons an acre. So even at 11 gallons, we didn't see that much more of an improvement than we did with the five gallons, but we did see an improvement with five gallons versus the three gallons. So I'm just gonna show you in the next slide, basically how we applied this out in the fields. So there we are. So these are the 500 gallon brewers that they originally started using. And you know, it was really challenging uh, for these folks to do seven 500 gallon tea brewers, put it out, and then make another uh, batch with the seven 500 gallon brewers, which is 3,500 gallons. So we were really limited by time uh, and volume. But one of the other big, big challenges as everyone on this, this call knows, especially Elaine, is that cleaning and disinfecting 3,500 gallons is not an easy task by any means. It took hours, if not days, to clean those tanks, especially if you're not good about cleaning them out directly after application, because then it's like, you know, paint, trying to get paint off on the wall. So anyhow, we figured out systems, and that's another really important thing when you scale up like this, is quality control. So we had methods and systems where we made sure, because the, these tanks that you're looking at on the trailers, this is an active extract that's actually going into the pivots. If you want to go to the next slide, I'll show you. So here we are, one of the 26 pivots. And if you look at the, down to the left there, there's a little blue pump. That's actually the injector. That's actually injecting into the large um, um, irrigation system. Uh, the big pivot there, and that's a big uh, four-inch steel pipe there. Uh, some of the pivots are actually electric, and some are actually gas. This is a big diesel um, motor that's driving this pivot. Um, but, you know, they have a combination of motors, diesel motors, and also electric. Um, but anyways, uh, so this is where we were actually injecting a 1,000 gallons of activated extract into this pivot. Uh, again, it took about 52 hours and one full circle to cover 50, uh, to cover the 300 acres, excuse me. Um, but we had really good results with it just at that rate because it was being tested. That's how we knew. And uh, so you want to move to the next one. So again, here's the pivots going out. You'll see one in the, that's actually the same pivot out in the foreground. So this is a big monster. Um, so um, very uh, high intense maintenance to maintain these things, but what a great way to apply the bioactive uh, activated compost extract. And so, um, you know, very effective method of applying the biology. Uh, if you want to move to the next one. So um, another challenge we had is how do we move all this biology to each pivot? So we went from the cumbersome tanks which we, you know, the cool thing about it is that we, we, we took these tanks that we were no longer using, I mean the brewers, and we converted them and made them so we could, you know, at least activate the material right there on site. So we went from that to these pony tanks. This is actually one of the smaller pony tanks, but we have 500 and 1,000 gallon pony tanks. And these tanks actually allow us to transport and deliver the extract. And again, this isn't an activated uh, tea. This is just a extracted uh, uh, you know, extract from high quality uh, vermicompost that they actually make on site now. And that little cone bottom tank and to the left of that tank is actually all the foods, things like fish, the humates, the molasses, and we have our own, you know, special recipes that we've kind of developed for these guys. But that allows us to inject the foods directly into the extract and either, either activate, because those tanks have aerators in them, or we'll just inject those foods into the tanks and put them right out right away. You know, because when you might be using, let's say more than five gallons of fish per, per, per uh, let's say per five gallons, per thousand gallons, 
Um, you could actually add too much food and it'll go south on you, so you might have to activate it. Um, but this was a great process to us, for us to transport large volumes of extract and then activate it there right on site with the foods. Uh, if you want to move to the next one. So anyways, you know, some of the, the results were, you know, not only did we see really good results on the microscope, but also visually. And that's one of the things as a practitioner that you want to kind of uh, zoom in on or zone in on is look at things underneath your feet. Look at what's happening. And one of the things that these folks notice is the rhizomorphs everywhere. They never had this before when I started with them. There was no fungi at all on the top of the soils or in the corn stalk, in the stovers, in the residual. And they also had no earthworms. Well, guess what? We have lots of earthworms now and we have lots of rhizomorphs. And they also noticed in the, in the residual, especially with the corn stalks, is there's a completely different hue. When you're looking at these fields from the roads, you can see a completely different hue on their fields compared to the conventional farms. Uh, big difference. And so it's really cool to see that, uh, that visual. And I was just there about a month ago. And same thing, you know, it's just I'm seeing the, the beautiful rhizomorphs everywhere on the, on the corn. Uh, stalks and uh, that are still sitting there on the ground and I'm seeing we're seeing lots of earthworms and I'm seeing lots of weeds non-invasive weeds that they never had before uh, these these perennial prostrate type weeds that are non-invasive or competitive with the corn and that's something they never had before so really cool stuff uh, next so anyways we went from a big hoop house uh, that we started with building, it was a steel building, but it was like a hoop building, uh, to a state-of-the-art uh, extract compost tea center. You know, it was close to a million dollars, this building, but man, did they do a great job at, at setting it up. But anyways, the, the photo to the left, you'll see the, the batch tank to the right, and there's basically four 2,500-gallon uh, uh, water tanks, and a lot goes into the water. We are actually structuring the water we are dechlorinating the water. So there's two 10,000 gallon tanks outside before they go into the water tank sources that we're gonna make extract from. So that's what you see on the right hand side is four, uh, four 2,500 gallons. So that's 10,000 gallons each. Uh, those are the batch water tanks that have been, basically the water's been prepped uh, before we make extract. And on the left side, those are the batch tanks of extract once it's made. Um, and to the right, you'll see basically the extractors. Uh, this year, we're going to be running two extractors. So in an hour, we can make close to, you know, uh, 5,000 gallons. Um, so uh, this says compost extract made on site, 30K gallons a day capacity. So we're really, really scaled up. And this is the crew to the left, the AgroBio crew. Uh, great group of guys, very, very smart. Um, and uh, basically, we this was uh, this was this past summer actually. Um, you want to move to the next one? I know my time's getting cut, but anyhow, so some really exciting uh, data that we're getting from this project. Uh, on the left hand side, you'll just see some corn growing uh, from a conventional corn on the left to the regenerative corn on the right, and both uh, both corn uh, stocks that you see that. Um, that's probably uh, a very early uh, stage. Um, but anyways, both of them have, uh, one's conventional on the left, the one on the right is regenerative, growing the biological program, no pesticides, no GMO corn, and no Roundup at all. Um, both are getting the same amount of nitrogen. Look at the difference. So this is uh, about 120 units of nitrogen. Um, and yet the regenerative, corn has got a much better head start than the uh, conventional. And that's actually us, us spraying in the middle there with the new, well, I think it's a used sprayer. It's about 190 feet and we've modified it. So the pump's been modified, the tips have been modified just to put out the bio, the uh, biocomplete uh, compost teas. And one of the things that we've really noticed in the last two years is that the kernels and uh, the basically the stalks the corn, I mean, we're just seeing so many cool things, but we, we're starting to see um, uh, the corn fill out a lot more on the tips. They, they, they've never seen that happen. You know, usually through nutrition, they can get this done, but they have a hard time with it. And this is actually corn feed. 
but they definitely notice a big difference uh, with the quality. Uh, the protein levels have gone up quite a bit. Uh, the bricks have gone from between eight to 10 to, we're close to about 14 on the brick levels now. Um, so we're just seeing some really, really neat stuff happening. Uh, you wanna go to the next one? So, you know, just kind of to summarize here with the York Farm results, um, you know, they, because they are becoming so successful with the regenerative process and the biological process, uh, they actually are now becoming a hub for a lot of their uh, neighbors that work, that are, and that are becoming regenerative. Uh, because, you know, all their neighbors are scratching their head going, you know, what is it you guys are doing? Because, you know, everyone kind of looks at these guys, you know, thinking they're just doing some crazy stuff and wasting their time and money, but they have actually are saving money, a lot of money, and they're growing uh, higher yields than their neighbors, and they're saving thousands, if not millions of dollars. I mean, it's really exciting. Collectively, this whole group, you know, the 150,000 acres total, I mean, the, the savings are enormous. Um, so... The biological extract application system that can be applied to large fields with spray rigs and fertigation. So again, you know, uh, these guys have been very successful at doing that. Um, and savings are enormous. Um, the health of the corn, the quality of the corn, the yields. Uh, so, you know, they are actually making money now. You know, typically, I think, you know, you're lucky to make $100 on an acre. And these, these folks have increased that to almost $400 an acre. Uh, they're actually making, uh, so they're saving an enormous amount of money and they're actually making money now. Um, so anyways, ongoing proof that, you know, the biological system can be adopted and profitable to both small and large operations. Uh, you wanna move to the next one? I think this might be the last one. So anyhow, um, you know, I, I'm a consultant uh, with, uh, you know, the website that I have is, uh, it's actually a fairly new website just for the consulting, which is www.organiclandcare.com. I invite you to come and visit my site. And uh, I just wanna thank everybody here for allowing me to present. Todd, thank you very, very much. It's it's so amazing to, you know, I, I get um, folks, farmers I, I get in contact with and, and I get this comment quite a bit, which is, oh, that's great in the small scale, but it really, you just can't can't do it on a large scale. And that's just absolutely not true. Uh, you can do it on a large scale. You just have to be mindful and you have to really think through the processes uh, and work with your farmers to make that transition. So well, thank I you, Don. I, that's I, I give these guys a lot of credit for what they've done and what they're doing and you know the commitment that they've made financially and time-wise. You know, it's just, it's, right. there needs to be more of these guys out there. That's all I can tell you. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. I, I have a client that's very similar to yours that's passionate about this and is taking the forefront in our area. It's the same thing. It's amazing to watch these folks uh, work because they're very good at problem solving. You, you give them a challenge and then I'm going to figure it out. And they, they do. They figure it out. So. Well, they again, had to do. All right. There's, there's a Go lot ahead. of opportunity out there. There's, you know, for, for consultants and people getting involved in, in the courses, um, you know, there's still a lot as Elaine knows, a lot of conventional farms out there. And, <laughs> and so there's so much opportunity out there globally for us to really take this, this science, you know, and, and, and make it the norm. It's, it's a huge paradigm shift that's occurring. And it's just a huge opportunity for so many folks to really make this change. We need to do it on a much larger scale. And, for you sure. know, we get, we get uh, kind of overwhelmed by the cost of one of their sprayers, you know, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for just that one piece of equipment. But if you're a large scale grower, if you've been growing on ten thousand acres um, every year, you've been buying Gigundo size equipment for as long as you've been alive. Your dad. Um, spent that much money on the tractors, your grandfather spent that much money, and they don't even blink when they have to take a loan out for, you know, to a million dollars or two million dollars. That's just what right. they expect. And so yeah. we have to not get unnerved by, gosh, right. this is so expensive. What, 
you know, what happens if there's a failure? Um, if you're keeping track, if you're using that microscope, there won't be a failure. This is not going to not work. So, <laughs> no, oh, yeah. attitude. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, enormous, half a million dollars. They got a couple planters. But the cool thing, Elaine, is that we have been able to adapt those equipment and modify them. Uh, so that's one thing I didn't really mention that, you know, we have – modified a lot of the existing equipment that's out there so you don't have to spend 250 it's just in that situation uh you know it's difficult to try to use a sprayer when it comes to the you know applying that biology the liquid part it's very difficult to use a conventional sprayer but other than that there's, there's a lot of modification yeah. Yeah. yeah many creative ways that we have soil food web uh that we can adapt existing equipment i'm sure Casey, you guys, and, you know, have been able to do it. Brian and Wes, you know, there's just so many different ways that we can modify these smaller sprayers out there, and uh, that might not have been used with chemicals, and so on and so forth. Yep. So For people sure. who are interested in large-scale growers, they've got a large-scale grower that they want to work with, then they should be coming and talking to you because you've already been through this process and you know some of the pitfalls, some of the things you have to say. So I think um, some of our folks going, thinking about being consultants, they need to have you as a consultant for a, a year or two while all of this conversion of the equipment has to happen. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's something to be said about world of experience, but um, <laughs> yeah, there's plenty of us that have gone through it that can help people that are on this, this webinar prevent you from making the same mistakes we might have made, because we've all made plenty of mistakes. That's how we learn. And we will continue Score to make those mistakes. But as a collective group that have, has gone through this, it's not like we started yesterday. You know, Elaine, I know I started working with you in the late 90s. I mean, we've got decades of experience and mistakes that we can help <laughs> prevent that from happening with a lot of people getting involved. That's part of the reason for the course, really. Yeah, yeah, it is really. Exactly. You don't want to have to go out and reinvent everything from the ground up. <laughs> Sorry, puns. Um, <laughs> you want to take somebody else's experience and not make those mistakes. And hopefully we'll be able to guide people in how do you actually really make this work. And it's a lot less expensive for the grower ultimately than yeah, right. the chemical approach. But I want to say to the entire group, it is extremely important extremely important when we're working on this kind of a scale we can't afford to make mistakes and that is the reason for the foundation course we need to know exactly what we're looking at and we need to know that we have systems in place that we're not going to produce e coli and spray it out on the entire field that can't happen and it won't happen and that's another reason for you know really promoting the, the course here is that it will prevent us from making those kind of mistakes instead of just going out and being the, like the wild west out there and saying i'm going to take this aged manure and i'm going to go spray it out so yeah, yeah for sure right, i think well, that's been a big issue with like compost teas and stuff these days a lot of people just load them with foods and then spray them out on crops and it's just like <laughs> no you, you gotta back away off of that stuff you can make things go haywire like this in a big tank like that and you literally be spraying yeah. poison at the end of the day you know so you really got to be careful on that you take the, the lid off of, of <laughs> <laughs> you take the lid off the top of your spray tank and poke your nose over the edge and it's like oh i think i'm gonna throw up maybe that's not compost tea anymore Yep. No, it's well, very important. It's funny you mentioned that, Lane, because I remember probably a decade ago, and I thought I was pretty dialed in. And, and it and it's, you know, the quality and the control parts of what we do is so important. And I remember I was, we were producing, I don't know, in one of our sprayers, and I don't know if you remember this, but I'm like, yeah, we're making really good tea, but, you know, lately it hasn't been that good, and we've been looking under the microscope, I can't figure out why, and and you guys, we just had this discussion about Elaine now. She just pulls stuff back and then she just throws it out there. Well, this was classic for Elaine, right? So she jumps in the, over, looks down in the tank. She goes, oh, yeah, it's the aerators. There's too much biofilm underneath the aerators. And I go, what do you mean? And I, and I go, we do a great job spraying it. And he goes, yeah, but how do you get those out? How do you get underneath? How do you get inside? And I'm going, oh, that's true. And so we just took it out. You know, we just cut it out and take the leg And sure enough, there's all the biofilm underneath. Wow. <laughs> I never even thought about that, you know, and so you know, 
there's, a, there's a lesson learned, you know, and uh, so anyhow. <laughs> yep, all the things you have to look for, all the things you have to be aware of, and that's right. what we're trying to teach them. Right. Yep. yep. So thank you so much for sharing all this data. Join the Soil Revolution today.